trust. Questions swirl about spies, lies, sanctions, Russia, and the potential for blackmail. Thousands of indigenous people taken from their homes as children win a landmark case. It is a great day in Canada. Plus the beast in the east. A massive storm bears down on Newfoundland. And later. Our Nick Purden set out to find refugees walking across the U.S.-Canada border. The cold reality he found. The White House says the only reason Donald Trump fired his national security advisor was because he could no longer trust Michael Flynn. Nothing to do with Flynn's now public conversations with the Russian ambassador about recent U.S. sanctions against Moscow or the broader questions they raise about the country's intelligence and security. Flynn submitted his resignation late last night, but today the White House confirmed he'd actually been told to resign and that Trump had known for weeks that Flynn had withheld the truth. Lindsay Duncombe has more. This man was in charge of keeping the United States safe for just over three weeks. The events leading to Michael Flynn's resignation read like a spy novel. Even Republicans are worried about what it all means. The whole uh, environment is one of dysfunction in the Trump administration as far as national security is concerned. On December 29th, the Obama administration sanctioned Russia for interfering in the election. Moscow vowed to retaliate. On that same day, Flynn spoke on the phone to the Russian ambassador. On December 30th, Vladimir Putin said Russia wouldn't retaliate after all. Donald Trump tweeted, great move. I always knew he was very smart. So did Flynn say something, even promise something about reversing those sanctions that got Russia to change tactics? If so, it would be a violation of protocol at the very least. A couple of weeks later, the vice president-elect said Flynn didn't talk sanctions. They did not discuss anything having to do with uh, the United States' decision to uh, expel diplomats or, or uh, impose a censure against Russia. Turns out, U.S. spies keep tabs on those kinds of calls. There are transcripts. Flynn was either lying or, as he put it, because of the fast pace of events, I inadvertently briefed the vice president-elect and others with incomplete information. Perhaps even more concerning, the president knew about all this for weeks. The White House confirms on January 26th, the Justice Department told the administration about the Flynn call and reportedly that the Russians could have information to blackmail Flynn. Yesterday, that story appeared in the Washington Post. Hours after that, Flynn resigned. Today, we learned Trump fired him not because Flynn did anything wrong, according to the White House, but because he didn't tell the truth. This was an act of trust. Whether or not he actually misled the vice president was the issue. But Congress wants an investigation. General Flynn's resignation is not the end of the story. It is merely the beginning. It is not the last chapter of this saga, but only the first. His resignation raises more questions than it answers, and the American people deserve to know the truth. There's another layer of complication here. There are reports today Russia tested a cruise missile in violation of a treaty with the U.S. Many see it as Putin testing Trump with their relationship already under intense scrutiny. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Some Canadian government officials said Trump appeared a bit distracted by the whole Flynn affair yesterday during Justin Trudeau's visit. But overall, they feel pretty good about how everything went and are already making plans for how to keep the relationship strong in the future. Tom Perry now with some of what went on behind closed doors. For a White House embroiled in scandal, Justin Trudeau's visit and even his name, it seems, is a fading memory. Yesterday, the president set, had an incredibly productive set of meetings and discussions with Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada. The Trump-Trudeau tete-a-tete may be yesterday's news south of the border, but in this country, the Prime Minister's office is still breathing a sigh of relief 
over a visit that could have gone much worse. A senior Canadian official who was briefed on the meeting tells CBC News Trump and Trudeau did manage to connect. The two leaders talked about their children and how they try to spend as much time as they can with them. The Canadian delegation knew going in Trump's daughter Ivanka had her father's ear, but her prominent role yesterday now has Trudeau's team seeing her as a strategic asset in the effort to build a relationship with her father. The two leaders did discuss a Trump visit to Canada, though there was no firm timetable. As for first impressions, the Canadians say Trump is the same in private as he is in public. Also, he doesn't know a lot about Canada. On Parliament Hill today, the focus was less on how Trudeau and Trump got along and more on what the U.S. president meant when he said he wants to tweak NAFTA. Now that we know that, uh, that NAFTA might have some tweaking, we have to worry about that when the trade disputes erupt. Obviously, we'll all be fighting to save those jobs. But what is tweaking? Mean? Well, we'll see, we'll see, we'll, we'll see. We'll have to wait in, uh, until uh, we receive specific uh, proposals uh, from, uh, from the U.S. administration. That senior Canadian official says there were no specific discussions about changes to NAFTA at yesterday's meeting, but that both sides agreed a review would make sense. Just a day after his meeting with Donald Trump, the Prime Minister's office tells us tonight Justin Trudeau today talked trade with the President of Mexico, with those two leaders committing to further discussions. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. If you saw the program last night, you saw former White House insider David Frum answering questions about the Trump-Trudeau visit. Tomorrow, he'll answer yours. In fact, anything you want to ask about the Trump White House, U.S. politics, and Canada-U.S. relations, we'll be doing a Facebook Live with David tomorrow at 12.30 Eastern. Like our page and then join the conversation. The estranged half-brother of the leader of North Korea is believed to have been killed. Kim Jong-nam was the oldest son of former leader Kim Jong-il. He had been estranged from his family since 2001, including the current leader, Kim Jong-un. For many, the injustice will never be righted. But an Ontario court decision today may be a step forward. A judge ruled in favour of victims of the so-called 60s scoop saying the forced adoption of thousands of Indigenous children meant the government had a duty to ensure those children didn't lose their cultural identity. Havard Gould has more. It is a great day in Canada when Canada's judicial system chooses to say that our children are so valuable and sacred and precious that we will protect them by law. What a day this is. Yes. Getting to this day took eight years of often bitter legal battles. The class action lawsuit covers an estimated 16,000 60 scoop survivors in Ontario. The damages being sought, more than $1 billion. In Ontario, the practice of taking Indigenous children and placing them with non-Indigenous families for foster care or adoption started in 1965 and carried on for almost two decades. I lost who I was, who I was supposed to be. Marcia Brown Martel has been the central figure in the case from the beginning. She was taken from her community in 1974 as a young child. The worst days of my life were my childhood. That's a simple statement, but it's true. The ruling acknowledges the devastating impact on children who were left fundamentally disoriented, at risk of psychiatric disorders, substance abuse, and more. It is a highly significant decision because it's the first time that the Canadian courts uh, say that the federal government had a duty to protect Indigenous culture. I just was lost. There will be no appeal. The federal government, which over the years tried to decertify the class action and more recently delay the ruling, signaled today it wants to start negotiating a settlement soon. It's really important that we get to the table as quickly as possible. We hope that they will come. We hope for a meeting by the end of the month. The ruling is expected to give other similar cases across the country a boost. 
Marcia Brown Martell says for her, it has lifted a great weight when she has carried since she was a child. Havard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. As Havard mentioned, there are currently 60 scoop cases in other provinces, including British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and Quebec. There's been no federal apology yet, but two years ago, Greg Selinger offered the first provincial apology for Manitoba's role in the practice. Coming up. I know uh, you'll do a good job. Thanks. <laughs> Tom Murphy introduces us to Halifax's new political rock star. Plus. Do you know where you are? No, I don't know where I'm at. Do you want to know? No. You're in Canada. Nick Purden encounters a refugee who just walked across the frozen border. A Winnipeg transit driver is dead after a brutal overnight attack. The shocking incident is raising questions about safety for transit drivers across the country. Cameron McIntosh has more. It was near the end of the route where it appears a lone passenger on this bus attacked the driver, causing fatal injuries in an assault that has rattled Winnipeg's transit users and drivers. I just know that my fellow brother was murdered for doing his job last night. I, I, that's all I know. 58-year-old Irvin Fraser was a veteran Winnipeg transit driver. At 2 a.m., he was stopped here at the University of Manitoba. Police say he was attacked with something sharp and died shortly after. A suspect was picked up nearby. What's not clear is the motivation for the attack. This is a rare instance. I think it's important for the investigators to have some time to determine what happened so that we can put this into context. While deaths are rare, assaults on Canadian transit drivers are not. This 2009 attack resulted in tougher federal laws for transit assaults. This former MP who pushed the issue calls this latest attack heartbreaking. It certainly reinforces the, the dangerous the dangers the public transit operators face and the need for them to have special protection in the criminal code. As a former bus driver, I want to uh, convey our thoughts and prayers for... In the House of Commons, the federal the infrastructure minister acknowledged the attack. So did the public safety minister. We all need to examine the law to make sure that it's as strong as it can be. Winnipeg's buses do have cameras and panic buttons. Other safety measures like shields are being considered. We're going to continue to be um, looking for ways to, to best protect safety of everyone involved. As this flag flies at half-mast, security is certainly on the minds of yeah. other drivers. How many crazies are out there that I just let on the bus and they're just on the verge? While a suspect has been arrested, no charges have been laid yet. Police say their investigation is ongoing. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. It's not just that their cases are suddenly being reported. The RCMP confirms there has been a surge in illegal border crossings by asylum seekers, people secretly coming into Canada from the U.S. And most of them, the police say, are arriving in Quebec. Alison Northcott explains why. This is not an official border crossing, but it's where many asylum seekers have been walking into Canada. Marcel Carrière lives nearby and has encountered numerous people, sometimes entire families, who have crossed the border illegally. And all he was saying was, uh, Canada, Canada. I said, yes, Canada. And then uh, he shook my hand and then he said another word, taxi, taxi, taxi. <laughs> I said, no taxi here, but uh, lots of police. Canada Border Services Agency says there were a total of 452 asylum claims at Quebec land crossings in January, three times more than the same time last year. And the RCMP says it's seen a significant increase in asylum seekers illegally entering the country in Manitoba and B.C., but the highest numbers are in Quebec. On either side of the border, uh, there are big cities and uh, big airports, so of course, like bigger cities on each side could mean more people trying to cross here. There were 42 claims in Quebec last weekend alone, including this family from Syria. Under the safe third country agreement with the U.S., asylum seekers who land in the U.S. have to make their claims there unless they manage to get to Canada illegally. This refugee lawyer says the political climate in the U.S. under President Donald Trump is prompting many to take that risk. I think it shows that uh, people in the States, many of them are desperate, and they found out more about how Canadian uh, refugee law works, and they're looking for any way to have access to a fair hearing. 
This man walked three hours through the woods last month to reach Quebec from the U.S. The taxi drove off me a uh, route. Uh, We're not identifying him because he fears for his safety in his home country of Turkey. He didn't want to stay in the U.S. because he feared it would be too easy for that country to send him back. And as a Muslim under President Trump, he says he felt unwelcome. That's my just last chance. Asylum seekers who cross the border illegally are arrested by the RCMP, questioned by investigators and taken to border officials to file their claims. Then they wait to find out if they can stay in Canada long term. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Atlantic Canada is still digging itself out from a lot of snow and there's more coming. Some people found themselves carving through walls of white. Schools and businesses were closed, but there was a brief respite from the skies as the storm that hit the Maritimes yesterday made its way east. And in St. John's, as the CBC's Garrett Barry shows us, bad weather met some romantic resilience. It's a good idea if you've got a, a nice warm place to stay to stay there today. well into Wednesday, it's the kind of storm that makes it hard for a meteorologist to do his job. You're going to want to keep, keep that, that in mind. mind. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> uh, right. Are we the only two people out in this weather? <laughs> Today, today there's, there's, there's going to be some guys that are going to be stuck. So we said, uh, all right, if you're if you're in the downtown area and you, you own a pair of snowshoes, come on over and uh, we'll take care of you and get you your Valentine's chocolate. It could have been a Valentine's disaster, but some couples were saved by this flower shop. I've had a couple of people for deliveries, uh, some couples that are buying for each other because they didn't get them yesterday and um, they're probably not going to leave their house today. But people did get out of the house to go romancing the storm. It's kind of nice to uh, be out around when there's nobody, nobody else around. You get that quiet and, yeah, I get to just be together with each other. For those who didn't pick up flowers or chocolates, here's another way to say I love you in Canada. A nice shovel driveway. It's also just great exercise. Just to get out of the house, boy, I, I stayed in bed as long as I could, couldn't stay in no longer. The shoveling isn't over yet. Snow and high winds are going to keep going all night. Up to 60 centimeters could be down by the time this is all said and done. Garrett Berry, CBC News, St. John's. Well, good news for nearly 200,000 people who live near a dam in Northern California. They're now allowed to go back home. It is safe to reduce the immediate evacuation order currently in place to an evacuation warning. Now, it's not at all clear, but there's less concern. The Oroville Dam's eroded spillways, which divert water when the levels get too high, will lead to flooding in nearby towns. Officials are also confident the dam itself can handle upcoming rains. The Montreal Canadiens have fired their head coach. Michelle Therrien is out after eight seasons. Coming in for a return engagement is Claude Julien. He spent three years with the Habs from 2003 to 2006. He'd been with Boston for the past 10 years and led the Bruins to the Stanley Cup in 2011. He was fired from Boston last week. Still to come in the program, a new Viewpoint contributor with her thoughts on Valentine's Day. But up next, the moment a near-frozen refugee learns he's finally made it to Canada. This week was National Weight Watchers Week in Canada, and 900 overweight women held their annual convention in Hamilton. Most of us talk a great diet. Most of us actually do very little about it. Push, pull, push, pull. 
These battlers of the bulge have come together in their common war, and they go through a weekly weigh-in, pay their two-dollar lecture fee, then listen to the hideous, piteous tales of their fellow fatties already on the diet program. I lost a ton of fat in my lifetime, but I never could keep it off until I found the Weight Watcher program. Now, most diets would put you on a 1,000 calorie a day program. The average junk lunch gives you 1,500 calories alone. Well, why not go for the extreme? Fasting, starvation, just stop eating. In Toronto, there is a clinic, and it will help you starve for seven days. The side effects of, of a six-day fast is not equivalent to more than the symptoms you might have from a three-day cold. In the past 10 years, fad diets have become more and more popular in Canada. I have tried the grapefruit diet, the banana diet, the citrus diet, the carbohydrate diet, the women's day diet. Swallow any pill. Hook up to any machine. Take inches off easily, the ads proclaim. HCG, made from the urine of pregnant women, is alleged to break down fat quickly. It's administered daily at $7 a shot. But the catch is, to make it work, you have to eat 500 calories a day or less. Dr. Stanley Bernstein's entire practice is devoted to HCG. A lot of people would call this a fad diet program. Yes, they would. Um, I feel it's because they're not aware of how well it works. The standard fat people's lament 95% of all diets fail within five years. People know this, but they keep hoping, looking for the magic bullet that the diet business, despite its promises, can't deliver. Apparently there is very, very little that can be called successful dieting. The failure rate is fabulous. He dropped us at some place, and he said, you cross this field, you cross the road, you see that field? That is the border. Well, it is a desperate journey we've been telling you about for weeks. The long, cold walk across the U.S. border to claim refugee status here in Canada. Ever since Donald Trump took office, more and more migrants have been making the trek, despite the danger. So we sent Nick Purden to one crossing point to talk to someone who made it to Canada safely and to look for others on the way. This is the story of how at 4.30 in the morning, I found a man freezing along the Canada-US border. Emerson, Manitoba, a town of about 700 right on the border. For a growing number of desperate migrants, this little town is a kind of promised land. In the last two weeks alone, more than 50 people have risked their lives and walked across these frozen fields. You hear a lot about this being the longest undefended border in the world. This is what that looks like. It's a quirk of law that if you're coming from the United States, the only way you can claim refugee status in Canada is if you sneak in. Okay, so here's the plan. Behind me is the United States. This road here is the boundary. It's getting dark, so in a couple hours, we're gonna come back here. We're gonna spend the night in and around here. If people cross, we're gonna talk to them. The hope of the migrants is that these last few kilometers will be the end of their journey. But it's a journey that doesn't always start in the States. For most of them, it actually started continents away. Standing at the end gets me wondering about the beginning. I was beaten up before I, I left Ghana. They used some kind of a jackknife and stabbed me and cut me. 
Ahmed Osa says he had to flee Ghana because people found out that he's gay. He tells me his life was in danger. So he flew to Ecuador, as many migrants from Africa do, because in Ecuador they don't require a visa. From Ecuador to Colombia, Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, um, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico, then United States. I want eight countries before I get to the United States. <laughs> yeah. But when Ahmed crossed into Texas, he didn't get the welcome he was hoping for. They bring his chains to put on the shackle, like shackle, as you say, your hand, your waist, and your leg. I was so, so, so mad. I wanted to ask him, what? Did I steal something? Am I, because back home, what I understand is somebody who is shackled like this is a hardened criminal. But it, it gives me the idea, like I'm thinking of this, the days of slavery, how slavery was chained. I cried. I cried a lot. Ahmed spent nine months in prisons in the U.S. A judge denied his refugee claim. U.S. law states that once a claim is denied, a person can be held for three months, but then after that, they have to be released. And so last November, before he could be deported, Ahmed fled to North Dakota. Then he paid someone $500 to drive him as close as he could get to the Canadian border. He dropped us at some place, and he said, you cross this field, you cross the road, you see that field, that's light that is like uh, blinking over there. That is the border. So if you go there, it's Canada. I was getting tired, and it was windy, and it's cold. We walked slowly, slowly until in the morning around 4 o'clock, they saw us like we were really cold. They had to make some tea for us. In fact, it was the first thing I, I will always keep in my mind when I get here in Canada was the way I was treated at the border. Not like the way, like, when I compare the two at the United States, I, I think I had the best treatment in Canada. Ahmed had his hearing and he was granted his refugee status on February 2nd. He now lives in Winnipeg. As I drive back to the border, Ahmed's journey is still on my mind. He walked for 12 hours before he was found. And he told me he still has no idea where he crossed. How am I going to find anyone? By 4.30 Saturday morning, the temperature is down around minus 17. I've been out all night and I start to think nobody's gonna cross. Then I see something on the side of the road. And when I get closer, I realize it's a man lying in a snowbank. This morning. This morning? What time? Mm. Morning, seven o'clock. How are you feeling? I'm not feeling happy. You cold? Yeah, I'm pretty cold. Yeah. Do you know where you are? No, I don't know where I'm now. Do you want to know? No. Yeah. You're in Canada. Mm. Is that what you wanted? Yeah. From Somalia. From Somalia? Yeah. Mohammed's been out here wandering in the cold for 21 hours. Okay. What, why did you want to come to Canada? Uh, I have a problem. What's the problem? Yeah, America's problem now. The people are going to take it back home, so my home is not feeling well. So my life is, is not like before, so it's a problem. Fighting, so I can't go back to my home. As much as I want to know more about Mohammed's story, I need to get him help, make sure he's okay. Okay, you're cold. We need to, um, we need to call. Okay.
Okay. RCMP dispatch, bonjour. Hi, how are you? It's Nick Purden calling. My, I'm in Emerson, uh, near the border, and we've just found a guy on the side of the road, a Somali guy named Muhammad. He's very cold. Okay, is he injured at all? Are you injured? Are you hurt? Your legs? Are you hurt? Are you injured? I'm not feeling well. He's not feeling well and he's cold. Okay. We do have officers on the way, so just let them know that, okay? Should we put Mohammed in the car to warm up? Yeah, if you can. Nick, before you do that, let me just get your phone number just in case I lose you. Okay, 416. Here, come on. Okay. Four, come with me. Mohammed hesitates. He checks the license plate. I'm guessing to make sure he really is in Canada. Yeah. Yeah, 505. Give me your bag. Okay. No visible weapons on him? No, I don't see any. I want to know where Muhammad's journey started and what he's running from. But this isn't the time. Muhammad's afraid the RCMP officer is actually an American and he'll be sent back to the US. Sir? Yeah. Okay, policeman, okay, I'm gonna take you over there and we're gonna go get you some medical care, okay? So, over there, okay? He's worried that you're an American police okay. officer. Yeah, sir, you have to come with me, okay? I'm a police officer and I'm gonna take you over to the Canadian port and we'll hear your refugee plan, okay? Do you understand? American police? Canadian police, RCMP. Yes. Okay, so Mohammed's gonna go get uh, processed at the at the border there, right there, right across. That's the Canadian border, and uh, see what happens to him. Along with Mohammed, 26 other people crossed the border illegally in and around Emerson on this night. If they don't have criminal records, they'll each get a refugee hearing in Winnipeg in a few months. Nick Purden, CBC News, near Emerson, Manitoba. We checked on Muhammad today, and he's now staying in a hotel in Winnipeg. He's submitting his formal refugee claim tomorrow. Up next, a young man who seems destined to shake up the Halifax establishment. These are the council chambers here in Halifax. This is where it's all gonna, it's all gonna go down. And Do you know where you sit yet? Meet Lindell Smith, a new politician with style, substance, and more support than he ever imagined. His story, next on The National. Showing off some skin has moved from the TV screens to the streets and now to the schools. It's a hot day. It's very it's hot. It's a hot day too hot for some anxious principals. You know, it was causing a distraction, there's no question. She sent home this note. Keep the underwear hidden. No exposed boxer shorts, no wayward bra straps. I think that we're perverted, like, like some guy will go, oh. From the archives of CBC News. If a girl should know how to dress for school, I think it's up to them, really. In tight sweaters while they're 
It's not very good, I don't think. I'd rather see a girl wearing blouses and stuff like that. Do you enjoy wearing mini skirts? Yeah. Well, I don't really prefer them on girls, but all I think is just that it, it modernizes the way the girls dress. The skirt rises up when you sit down, so you have to put your books something on your knees or something to hold it down. I just don't like the idea of them wearing way up here. It looks, you know, it looks it's not, not right. That was Barbara Emil getting the long and short of the miniskirt story. School's back all over the country now. Did today's back-to-schoolers reject the dictates of the department stores? Here on What's New, we took a look at how kids actually went back to school this fall, and what we saw were students like these. You can read a book in jeans, you can go to school in jeans, you can roll down a hill in jeans, you can do whatever you want in jeans. In the late 60s, there was pressure on the schools to relax dress codes. Shorter skirts, pants for girls, and eventually jeans were allowed for everybody. The freedom that the children have known for the past 15 years has been just a little bit too much. The parents have decided to adopt a uniform this year. They do seem to be more serious. And we work harder because we look, uh, look better. Teachers don't really know whether uniforms make any difference to the children's schoolwork, but both teachers and parents hope the uniform is here to stay. I guess I was brought up different than most kids. I just don't believe in wearing stuff that vulgar, as my mother calls it. A piece of film was supposed to have been cut to open this year's Festival of Festivals, but the organizers couldn't find any, so an old-fashioned ribbon was used instead. This evening, the gala premiere belongs to a Canadian film, Ticket to Heaven. A number of limousines have pulled up with well-dressed people, and fortunately, nobody seems to know who they are. Despite the problems, after the film, it was party time, and there was everything you'd expect at a showbiz bash. Stars, Booze, good-looking women, good-looking men, people dancing to the music of Martha and the Muffins, and more booze. It's Warren Beatty night at the Festival of Festivals, where the spotlight shines on everyone. The ushers at the theater had their hands full. It was their job to make sure the fans and the stars didn't collide. But when the big black Continental pulled up to the curb, there was no stopping the autograph hounds. I'm very proud of myself from restraining myself from attempting to wrestle them to the ground because that's exactly what I wanted to do. This was opening night, a gala for the North American premiere of Joshua Then and Now. There were Klieg lights and limousines, but there were also some charming down-home touches. The star, James Woods, arrived with his proud parents who came in from Rhode Island for the event. Now the oh-so-cool set have decreed Canada's little festival that could a must. <laughs> that, of course, is Robin Williams, Claudia Schiffer. It's the only film festival in the world where you see all of the most important films. You see a whole year come in advance. As un-Canadian as it is to gloat, movie critic Roger Ebert says go right ahead. Yeah, it's okay, Canada. It's okay. It's a real big, real good festival. <laughs> I am ready to be the voice for a new and bold District 8. It's time for a committed counselor who is deeply invested in the area. Thoughts and perceptions play big in politics. That's what made Lindell Smith's campaign for a seat on Halifax City Council unique and unlikely to succeed. But then he won by a landslide. Tom Murphy tells us how Smith broke the mold to offer a new hope to many in the city. I, Lindell J. Smith, do swear that I will be a faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. Just 26 years old, he's one of the newest, certainly the youngest, of Halifax's city councillors. But to many, he's much, much more than that. Mama, we did it. <laughs> he sure did. Lindell Smith is the first black councillor elected here in 20 years. A one-time political hopeful who's now the one offering hope. So yeah, this is your street. Yes, it is. All of this happening so fast to such an unlikely candidate. Smith is kind of reserved and, well, not exactly from central casting. 
He's more comfortable in cornrows than corduroy. And he never gave it a second thought until a friend said this. Are you afraid that people are going to look at you as the Snoop Dogg of this election? And we thought about it, and it's a, it's a legit question. If that's what people see, then sure. But I'm not going to change who I am because of, of um, the thoughts of perception. Fact is, he's neither punk nor politician. And that look, and Smith admits this himself, did make some people pause on the hustings. There's been moments where people haven't answered their doors. They look out the curtain, kind of give me the look up and down and, and then leave. But at the same time, 98% of it was also supported and great. I, I really can't say I had a lot of negative experiences. When they did open the door, they saw a young black a man with a deep desire to better his community. And I'm proud to watch my daughter grow up here too. And this slick social media campaign, it didn't hurt either. I am ready to be the voice for a new and bold District 8. Smith it's won in a landslide a with votes from all corners of the district, white and black, young and old. Open the door. Maybe it's his actions that give people hope. What you have for lunch? Already in his short life, Smith has started a not-for-profit recording studio for young people, run literacy programs, and worked on a youth project opposing gangs. Remember how busy we were Saturday? Yeah. All the while raising a daughter with the support of his tight-knit family. Um, and it's going up very fast. Smith has inherited a tough job. The community is feeling squeezed by new development. And then there's the gun violence and long-standing racial tensions. Last year alone, seven young men from the black community were murdered in Halifax. What do you make about the world that you're being elected into here? It was very hard to focus during my election with so many things happening, with the violence, with the racism being put to the forefront, but especially with the violence to the young black males from the communities that I've, I've had roots in. All that loss was very hard on me and a lot of people around me. Does it feel like being a part of the government? <laughs> I told you, you know the what? magic number. You know, what's it mean to have a guy like Lindell on council now? Oh, it's going to be huge. Uh, he's going to be a step and a good voice for our community. You're representing something that's big. I know uh, you'll do a good job. Thanks. <laughs> it's like you're a rock star. I don't know. I, it's, for me, it's really strange to have. I, I don't even know how to put it into words. You kind of struggle with it a bit, don't you? I do. I do, because I'm not a front runner. I'm not a, I'm not a person that wants the limelight. It's not about me. It's about, it's about trying to make sure that everyone has a, a piece of the pie and, and make sure that everyone feels included. Maybe that's how a movement starts. Make people feel included, part of something. And we want what's right. So says Rhonda Britton, pastor of the local Baptist church. Our concerns, we have to be around the table to bring them. If you're there to tell the story, it's all the better. So I think that's very significant uh, for the black community, for young people, and for Halifax as a whole. This is the chambers. This These is, are the council chambers here in Halifax. This is where it's all gonna it's all gonna go down. And Do you know where you sit yet? Have you figured that out? Yeah. On this day, the first council meeting for the newly elected council. Oh, look, did they spell your name correctly? Bye. The big question on Smith's mind, with expectations so high, how does the lone black voice on council make change? And how significant is it for your community to now have you here mm -hmm. elected in this position? It's it now gives them that glimmer of hope that they're being heard. Welcome to Halifax Regional Council, November the. The guy beside Smith is Way Mason, former teacher, mentor, and now fellow councillor. The problem with becoming a figurehead of a movement is you're a figurehead of a movement. I hope people uh, remain excited, but that they're moderate in their expectations because he is just just a human being after all. He's just one man. This is one of those moments when someone who has captured people's imagination is elected to office. A moment full of promise and hope for a young man with no political experience, 
who already seems to represent something bigger than himself. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. We'll be right back with our Viewpoint segment. This week, a Canadian author shares her thoughts on the pleasure and pain of February 14th. Time to check today's business numbers. While the dollar was basically unchanged, there were record highs elsewhere on both sides of the border for the TSX and also for the Dow Jones and the NASDAQ. Oil was up slightly. My name is Yevita Bedlovska. I'm an author and a columnist. And I want to talk to you about the most romantic day of the year. For a long time, I loved Valentine's Day, which came as a surprise to pretty much anyone who knows me. I found it surprising too, because I had always been the person who dismissed it as silly and fake. But here's the thing. Life happened. I met my husband on Valentine's Day, and because of the kind of couple we were, 
From then on, Valentine's Day was on. Like so many others, we went nuts. Gifts, restaurants, and eventually a babysitter. The last Valentine's Day my husband and I spent together was the most over-the-top one yet. It was a gong show. There was a lobster dinner and a Fifty Shades of Grey screening. And because nothing could possibly top lobster and Christian Grey, we broke up. Well, we didn't break up because of Christian Grey. But what followed was a year of heartbreak, disillusionment, and eventually divorce. So what's a newly single, single mom on Valentine's Day supposed to do? Swipe right on Tinder and hope I get lucky? Yeah, no, not today. You know what I decided? I don't care to celebrate a day that got its name from a pair of Christian saints executed by third century Roman emperor, but I'm not going to turn into Bridget Jones on my couch in an ugly robe either, because the ex and I are in a good place. No Valentine's for us, but I may call him and we'll joke about how the pressure is off this year. He's even going to watch our kid while I go out tonight with my best friend. Valentine's Day has become a day that too many of us take way too seriously, whether we're romantics or cynics. So let's just relax and forget about the significance of a day that is not really significant at all. Because real love doesn't need an overhyped celebration. And if you skip the long stem roses and chocolates this year, remember that romance is sweeter when you're authentic about it. And there is nothing authentic about a Hallmark moment. For The National, I'm Jovita Budlowska. I'm Laura Lynch. Tomorrow on The Current, reviewing the judgment in the Ontario class action lawsuit involving 16,000 Indigenous children who were forced into the care of non-Indigenous families. The 60s Scoop on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. the oldest camera in the world. And this, the oldest existing photograph, taken in 1826. Then in 1851, a new process came along. A glass plate had to be meticulously cleaned. It was then coated with collodion to form a thin, even film on the glass. It was a cumbersome method, but the glass gave clear, sharp negatives and unlimited prints on paper. With me now is the promotion manager for a black <coughs> camera chain. This is the uh, Kodak uh, Instamatic. You just simply flip the back like so, open it up, mm -hmm. and I'll let you take it from there. I there will now a... play the part of the child. If I can okay. operate as a child can, and that will show you how easy it all is to I do. Knew, I knew if I said that it would come out backwards, and it did. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the roll of film. Just to... it, turn it around, and zap You want to take an indoor picture? Yes, you I pop do. pop on a cube? Yes, a cube. Now, and then I just, just push, push that and I got a picture, and that's it. All right, stand back, everybody. Nope. Well, hey, picture. folks, it works. One of the keys to taking good pictures is the size of your film. The larger the negative, the better chance you'll get sharp results. That's the knock against the disc cameras. They're easy to use and inexpensive. But if you plan to get any of your pictures enlarged, the tiny negatives in disc film are a real liability. This new film method comes complete with its own lens and shutter. It slips easily into a pocket and it can be developed in the usual way. Until now, camera companies were in a race to produce the most portable and the cheapest of the instant filmless cameras. And the announcement by the Japanese Fuji Group is a major leap forward. This is when you hook to your computer. Looks like a telephone. It's a camera that'll hold 32 images in electronic memory. Then you can transfer them to your computer. Can you take my picture with us? Be, right. be glad to. All right. All right. Ready? Smile for oh, the computer. S smile for the computer. Ready? One, two, three. And right. once they're in the computer, can you print them on your printer? You can print, print them on your printer. You can uh, put them, say, into a publishing program if you want to include them in a newsletter. Oh, this is exciting. I look pretty darn stupid there. How much is this job? Th this one's $800. Okay. 
Modern photographers can work with precision because of the technical advances of the late 19th century. But the mystery and magic of photography remains in the way silver crystals gather together after being exposed to light. If we label him now, it's over. The A Word, Sunday at 8 on CBC. On an all new X Company. I need to know if the spies know about Marigold. Talk or he dies. The Nazis are cleaning out a village tomorrow. Operation Marigold is in the Belgian refinery. X Company. Drop your weapon. Wednesday at 9 on CBC. Canada is home to plenty of sweet-sounding spots to take your sweetheart this Valentine's Day. You'll find Chocolate Cove in New Brunswick, Sugar Beach in Toronto, and Honey Harbor in Muskoka. For champagne, head to Yukon. But if flowers are more your thing, then Rose Valley, Saskatchewan by any other name might be Rose Lake, B.C. Saskatchewan also has Hearts Hill, Alberta has Heart Lake, and there's plenty of heart in Newfoundland and Labrador. Heart's delight, heart's desire, heart's content, and to top it off, Cupid's, while St. Valentin is in Quebec. Not much is left of romance in Saskatchewan, but love itself is there. Stephanie Skanderis, CBC News, Regina. Well, Canada's affinity for love extends to south of the border as well. A sculpture in downtown New York City has won a Valentine's Day design competition. The project leader is a Canadian. As Stephen D'Souza tells us, the art gets to the heart of a global conversation. In the middle of Times Square, a new art installation is at once a Valentine to the people that made the city and a strong message of protest in turbulent times. Up close, it shows the countries, big and small, that make up the fabric of the city. But as you step back, that's when the message of the sculpture comes into focus. It's Valentine's Day, so the heart really works. The sculpture was created by an artist collective headed by Canadian Jer Thorpe. For us, the underlying metaphor is an easy one. It's that the heart of this city is immigrants. You know, more people live in this city that are foreign born than any other city in the world. The numbers come from a 2015 census. There are more than 100 countries listed, showing how in a city of over 8 million people, more than 3 million were born somewhere else. The installation was created as part of an annual competition to create a Valentine's themed sculpture for the square. I think that part of the role of art is to encourage conversation and discussion. And part of what Times Square is, is it really, it reflects whatever the spirit of the time is. The piece is titled, We Were Strangers Once Too a phrase from a 2014 immigration speech by former President Barack Obama. To me, it's not an accident that it was a Canadian artist and a Canadian designer who said, we want to make an observation that even Americans themselves may not see so clearly. Thorpe is a Vancouver native who has lived in the U.S. since 2010. He says while they try to present the facts without editorializing, the numbers themselves speak volumes. I think New Yorkers as a whole have really rejected a lot of these policies that have been pushed forward by the current administration. And I think one of the reasons for that is we live in it every day. We live in a diverse community every day. We know um, how important it is. For visitors, the impact of the sculpture is immediate. I find it a very, very bizarre climate at the moment. Uh, the whole world, Brexit as well. So for me, um, yeah, diversity and solidarity together, it's got to be going forward, one world. Tomkin says while Times Square is known as the crossroads of the world, it's also where Americans from all political stripes cross paths. And so who knows, maybe you'll have a Republican and a Democrat look at this and start a conversation. Wouldn't that be great? That's Thorpe's ultimate hope for the peace. I want to change one by one the visitors to this, to this piece. I want to get them thinking a little bit differently. And that happens when they're in the sculpture. It happens when they see the heart. It, it happens when they walk away. He says he hopes they walk away feeling a connection to the city and to each other. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. That's The National this Tuesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.